Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrea Miller and I am the president and founder of CDG Care. We are delighted that you could join us as we offer you this second webinar in our 2021 patient education webinar series. This program is generously supported through a grant from Traver Therapeutics. Following today's webinar and slide presentation, community members will also find a list of rare disease sibling resource organizations, as well as an additional listing of national and international resources, webinars, and articles in support of this topic. The PDF version of today's webinar is also available on our website at www.cdgcare.org under the resources tab. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Courtney List, for today's webinar entitled, The Life of a Special Needs Sibling. Courtney is a 23-year-old sibling and caretaker of Danielle, also known as Dee, who has PMM2 CDG. Courtney and Dee reside in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where they enjoy getting iced coffee and jamming out to music in the car. Courtney has volunteered with the Special Olympics of Western Pennsylvania, Best Buddies, and the Miracle League. Courtney earned her bachelor's in public relations and advertising and her master's degree in management at Point Park University in Pittsburgh. She currently works as a marketing manager for McCaffrey Interests Incorporated. Courtney's favorite quote to live by is, the only disability in life is a bad attitude. Without any further ado, I am delighted to turn the platform and today's presentation over to Courtney. There we go. All good? Everyone can see? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today in this presentation. Um, this is my little sister, Danielle D. List, as Andrea said. Um, I'm 23 years old and we live in Pittsburgh, PA. So excited to share a little bit with you all about our relationship and my experience and role as her sibling and caretaker. We already went over the friendly reminders. Um, and you already got a little intro, so we'll dive right in. So I wanted to kick start off this presentation by prefacing that I'm not a doctor. I do not have a psychology degree. Uh, I did not even collect data. This is just uh, my personal experiences, and I really hope that this uh, insight is beneficial to you all. Feel free at the end to ask questions. I did collect some really awesome questions for our community before this uh, event today. So I've incorporated some of those into the presentation. Um, and I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of information on Danielle's medical history from my perspective. Um, so you can kind of get a better understanding of uh, what it's been like as a sibling going through childhood with a, a, a young child who has a rare disease. Um, so Danielle is getting ready to turn 21 this November. Uh, she was diagnosed about 20 years ago. So her CDG diagnosis took about 11 months for us to get. Um, and hearing some of everyone else's stories, it actually seems to be a pretty quick um, diagnosis. Um, but it was a little interesting. So my mom began leaking fluids around 16 weeks and was put on bed rest. So at the time I was only about two years old. So it wasn't really easy for her or my family. We had to adapt quite a bit, but luckily I was still young enough that I, I didn't know any different. Mom was just home uh, with me. And I was very fortunate with my dad's work schedule that he was able to be with me. And grandma also got to chime in and babysit me a lot. So I just was feeling all of the love, getting all of the attention. Um, and then, um, yeah, we would, our days off would consist of us going to sonogram appointments and checking these measurements. Um, eventually at 36 weeks, the fear of infection outweighed the risk for low weight. So this decision was made to induce and little D was born at four pounds, 10 ounces. And she went home after the delivery two days later, just like normal. Um, so really no signs that anything was wrong. Um, once we got home, she started to struggle to feed a bit um, and started to have a few developmental delays. Um, so my parents tried a few things, but ultimately she was really struggling to gain weight. Um, so at six months, we were admitted to the hospital for a week for failure to thrive. Um, and 
again, I, I was just a young kid. Uh, this is actually a photo of Danielle um, in the hospital when she was admitted at six months. You can see they put the IV right in her head. They couldn't find a vein. Um, so two-year-old me right from the get-go was kind of exposed to Danielle's, as we called them, boo-boos. Um, so nothing was ever really hidden from me from, from the start. Um, I got to go and visit Danielle in the hospital during that time. Um, and I, I think that was really beneficial for me to see that it, it wasn't hidden from me. Um, she was then after that visit, she was prescribed with a special formula for food allergy. Um, and we were given in-home therapy a few times a week. And that was incredible. So the therapy for us was kind of like our playtime. Danielle, you know, as all of us know, the first couple of months and first couple of years, she was fragile and I didn't know how to play with her and how to interact with her. And so it was really great when the therapist came in that they early intervention just got me working with Danielle. They wanted me to be included in everything. Uh, and that was really beneficial for me. I, I felt like I got to really bond with Danielle during those times. And I felt like the therapists were equally there for me as they were for her. Um, so that was really great. Um, and I also think just getting the exposure of the medical uh, at such a young age in the therapies, it really helped to normalize special needs for me. It never felt odd to me. It just felt like normal playtime, which I, I think was great. And I think it's a lot of experience that a lot of our siblings feel. It doesn't feel abnormal to us. It's, it's just our life and it's, it's what we know. Uh, so then after we started to get some therapies, we still didn't have a diagnosis. So eventually we met with a doctor in Cleveland in 2001 and he confirmed Danielle had CDG and he gave us some really great advice. He told us not to go to the internet, not to do any research uh, on the prognosis of his other patients. He said, work closely with your PCP to give Danielle the best chance in life. Um, and he told us to let Danielle be the guide. And that was the words that we needed to hear in that moment and the words that we've continued to live by essentially our whole lives. Uh, and I think that that is really um, beneficial, especially for our younger siblings. It, it can seem so uh, traumatizing and it can see there's so much adversity. Um, so it's really great to just stay optimistic and let your sibling be the guide and see their potential and all that they can do. Uh, and that's, that's essentially what that doctor told us in Cleveland in 2001, and it's been helpful ever since. Mm, let's see, there we go. Um, so Danielle kind of had her first few scares with us. She had three stroke-like episodes and a, a seizure-like episode. Um, and those instances uh, usually were in conjunction with a migraine, um, but were very terrifying experiences for me as a sibling to go through. Uh, specifically the seizure-like episode. Uh, when Danielle had that seizure-like episode, I was in my first few months as a freshman in college. So I had gone away only about 30 minutes to school, um, but I was playing volleyball and I had a full course load. So I was pretty busy. Um, and my parents decided to not tell me that Dee had a bad migraine and that she didn't, they did not tell me about the seizure like episode until after Danielle had been admitted to the ER and I'd finished class and practiced for the day. Um, we learned from that experience to not hide things, which was good um, because I was very upset when they called to tell me what was going on. I immediately rushed to the hospital. Um, so that was something everyone has that experience. We learned to keep me in the loop with all things. Um, but it was really, it, it was really scary and something that my peers on the volleyball team didn't understand what I was going through. My, my friends didn't understand what that fear was like of getting that call. Um, and so just different adversities that we face as a special needs sibling. Um, I, it's hard because we walk a fine line between a sibling and a caretaker. I was joking with my mom this morning. Sometimes I feel like Danielle's parent um, just because of the nature of our relationship. So it's really difficult in those crisis situations because you just want to be there and to love them like a caretaker. Um, it was also difficult. Danielle does not complain much. So when she is sick, um, you feel like you have to constantly monitor her. So after those stroke-like episodes and those seizure-like episodes, 
I remember anytime Danielle would blink weird or she was a little delayed in her communication, I would panic that another seizure-like episode was going on. Uh, so it was, it was difficult to work through for a few months after that until we healed from the trauma and we got through it and you, you know that they're going to be okay. It's just something difficult that you have to, to go through and work through together as a family. Um, so after those uh, instances, Danielle really became stable, I would say around age five. Um, she really wanted to be like every other kid. She was very motivated by me and she really wanted to get involved. So around age seven, we got her into adaptive baseball. She joined the Special Olympics and got to do a lot of fun, normal kid activities. Um, and it was very beneficial for me too, because that was the first time that I really started to get to volunteer uh, with different nonprofit organizations. I got to really play with my sister, playing baseball and running the bases is one of my most favorite summer memories every year. Um, so that was, it was really nice once she stabilized that we were able to do those cool things together, but it also um, gave me an opportunity to be present in her life in other fun and cool ways. Um, we often joke, I definitely am the one that pushes D, I challenge D. And so in these activities, it's been really great to continue to be able to, to do that for her. Um, I made her swim without her swim belt. We've been going strong without that for several years now. So it's just really exciting to see her grow as a young lady. So that's kind of the basis of Danielle's past medical history um, and how it's impacted me. So I'm going to jump into some frequently asked questions, a lot that I received from our community and the Global Alliance page. Um, and then feel free after these uh, frequently asked questions, if there's an area that I didn't touch on enough or something that you have additional questions on, feel free to chime in. Um, one of the most common questions that were asked by our non-CDG community was what it's like to have a sister with CDG. And I often describe it as just being a parent or a caregiver. I am extremely involved in Danielle's life and I would do absolutely anything for her. It's not always easy, but I wouldn't choose to change my life for anything. And it's important to remind ourselves that CDG does not define Danielle. Uh, it makes her who she is. And because of who she is, I am who I am. So in a, a weird way, we are, we are grateful for the experience that we have gone through together. And I think that it's really bonded us and made us closer together. I love our, our special sister bond. In many ways, uh, CDG and being a sibling has impacted my life. Uh, I've definitely been... Uh, much more mature than all of my peers. I've had to grow up a little bit faster than most um, kids. Um, but again, it's, she has made me a better person and I'm so grateful for that. Another really good question that was asked is if I had to do more household chores and if I had to help meet my siblings' medical or personal needs. And absolutely I did, just like all of our other siblings out there. Uh, I feel your pain. <laughs> I used to get a little bit frustrated because I did have more responsibilities than my friends growing up, uh, especially when both of my parents were working. I would stay at home and hang out with Dee, and I did really enjoy it, but it, it is an added uh, responsibility that some, some of your friends may not have to go through. Uh, when I was younger, I remember being really frustrated when I would help clean up from dinner and Dee just got to go sit on the couch and watch TV. What the heck? I wish I could be doing that, but my mom and dad would yell at me and they're encouraging it from her. Um, so that was definitely something that we've, we've worked through the last few years and I'll touch on that a bit later. Um, in, in regards to medical and personal needs, I have always been very involved with Danielle, uh, but I've, I've chosen that. I've chosen to be involved. I attend her doctor visits. Uh, I recently stayed with her in the hospital for a few nights, uh, traveled to Philly to see our awesome specialist, Dr. Edmondson, and I definitely support her emotionally. Um, really want to stress the emotional support. Um, there are certain things that Danielle only feels comfortable coming to me with, which is wonderful. I think it speaks volumes of our relationship. 
And I I love that she feels so comfortable with me, but there are times where there's a sister secret that needs to be addressed with mom or dad and trying to balance that fine line of trust with Danielle, but also making sure that she's taken care of. Um, It can be pretty stressful, uh, especially Danielle loves to text. She's not a uh, in-person communicator. Um, So sometimes I will get paragraphs of text messages while I'm at work. um, And it's, something that needs to kind of be addressed or taken care of. And that can be a little bit stressful, but I'm so happy she feels comfortable with me at the end of the day and that we have that strong bond that she, she feels a strong connection that she can talk to me about things that are bothering her. Um, And again, this kind of all just adds into those extra stressors that we as special needs siblings face on a daily basis that are not necessarily typical for what some of our friends and our peers are going through. Um, So it's really important uh, to handle those stressors and those bumps in the road um, and making sure that you have different stress relief outlets. Uh, Mine has always been sports and working out. Uh, Even going to church has really helped me a lot. So as a special needs sibling, just making sure that you're having that me time and you're finding what kind of makes you de-stress Um, and helps you just feel better at the end of the day. I have really found it important to incorporate different hobbies and activities in my life. Uh, I find it really important to kind of find your identity and your life outside of being a caretaker, outside of being special needs. There's so much more that you offer. um, And I think it's really important to find that journey for yourself. It's definitely been immensely helpful for me. to find my happiness outside of Danielle, my family, who I love so much, but finding those other things that I'm really passionate about. Um, One of the questions that were asked was, do you feel like you had less opportunities for free time or your hobbies? And I was very lucky. I, I don't feel like I had less opportunities for free time. My parents were so selfless and made so many sacrifices to make sure I had the the normal childhood as much as possible. Um, They took me to birthday parties and took me on -on one-on-one dates, um, like a daddy-daughter movie date. Love those pictures and those memories I hold. I cherish them so much. Um, And it was really helpful around age five. When Danielle's kind of stabilized, I was able to start playing some sports. And it was nice because my parents and Danielle could come to the games and support me. Dee became my greatest cheerleader. And we even at that age started to see that there were some activities that could be adapted for Danielle to do as well. Um, So I don't ever feel like the hobbies or opportunities were limited for me. I think my parents did a really great job of making sure I had endless opportunities, which I'm very grateful for. And that kind of rolls into the attention. I know we have a lot of parents and caregivers out there that were uh, interested to know if I felt like I wasn't given enough attention compared to my sibling. And again, I was very fortunate. Um, My parents did a wonderful job in giving me one-on-one time. Since I did have two parents, they uh, were great in allowing one person to be taking care of Danielle while the other was giving me attention reading books, watching Elmo, whatever the activity was, I I never felt like I was neglected. Um, They also weren't ever fixated just on Danielle. It was always included in the conversations. Again, I wasn't left out of anything. Um, I think it was also important that at that age, uh, Danielle was going through therapy. So again, that was, that was our playtime. That was our bonding time. And I was willingly accepted into those therapy sessions. So I kind of became the helper and the protector um, so we really didn't have much to fight over. Dee had her toys, which was therapy, and I did my own thing. So there was never any, uh, any territorial animosity between us. I, I always kind of fulfilled the role of protector and helper, um, which is still prevalent today. My parents also, I, I mentioned this earlier, I know some of you had asked for um, some advice on how to give attention uh, and creative ways to, to your special needs siblings. And I still to this day remember going on one-on-one dates with my dad, even if it was for a drive around the block or we stopped to get ice cream or it was a movie night. Uh, those things were so important to me um, and things that we, we still do to, to this day that are really beneficial. 
Um, the other question that was asked was, did you ever have to miss going out with friends to just sibling needs? And the answer sadly is absolutely. I mean, there are just naturally are things that come up. There's illness, there are those crisis moments. Um, there, there are things that I have missed out on, but it never felt like a burden to me. It was all things that I wanted to be there for. D had an event on a Friday night and I had friends getting together. I most likely wanted to go to whatever Danielle was doing, her cheerleading game or her, her basketball game. I wanted to be involved in those things. And same goes with medical wise. I, I wanted to be at her doctor's appointments over going to different things. Um, so they're sacrifices, but they're also choices. Um, my parents have really tried to encourage me to not try to attend everything because it can be overwhelming. Um, but I feel this guilt if I'm not there because I want so badly to support her. Um, so that's, an, that's another balance as an adult that I'm starting to work through is how do I support Danielle while still having a life? Um, because that's important too. I really liked this question. Were you ever angry or frustrated with being the sibling of someone with special needs or were you frustrated for your sibling? And I really had to think about this one. Danielle and I never fight. Um, that is, she is my best friend in the whole world. So I couldn't remember a time that I was really ever ang angry with her. The only time I know that I would get frustrated is when she wasn't given as much responsibility as me. That would frustrate me. Um, or she wasn't pushed to be as independent as I was. Um, but I get very frustrated for Danielle when people stare or make rude comments. Another thing that really bothers me is when people talk about Danielle, but not to her. Um, she is so smart uh, and she's at that age where she notices things. She notices when people aren't giving her the respect she deserves. And that frustrates me because she does not advocate for herself. So I feel like I have to um, naturally. And that's one area that definitely has frustrated me is people just not being educated on special needs and the proper way to communicate and interact with those individuals. So that kind of feeds into how I handle my emotions. And if I was able ever able to talk to someone or seek guidance. And again, I was fortunate. My family and I are really close. So I always felt really comfortable going to mom and dad and telling them how I was feeling or telling them when something was going on. Um, I was really interested after our last rare disease symposium. Um, there were a lot of emotions that got stirred up in me after that um, symposium that I really wanted to find a sibling support group or find some type of a therapist um, who specialized in rare disease or special needs. And it was something that sadly fell off my priority list, but something that I think would still be very much beneficial. Um, I did see a therapist in high school, which really helped me kind of sort out my emotions. Uh, I stopped seeing that therapist in college, but I think it's something that can always be beneficial, especially for special needs siblings who, I mean, we, we handle a lot. And I, I think that it's important to have a, a cushion and a wall to talk to who might not always be in your family. Um, the next question, do you have suggestions for siblings who are just learning about the diagnosis? And I, I think back to that 2001 doctor's appointment in Cleveland of letting your sibling be the guide. Um, don't go to Google to research. That's a terrifying place. Stay involved um, with your sibling to your comfort level. Uh, what I do with Danielle and what Vanessa might do with her sister um, or Eli does with Oliver, all of those things are um, to your comfort level. What works for one of us may not work for everyone. So get involved to your comfort level and always stay optimistic. Um, again, it can be, it can be frustrating and sad to see your sibling going through something, but always really think to their potential. Um, things might need to get altered or shifted for them to do the things that you do. Um, but there, there's always that potential that, that they can do the same things that you can accomplish. And always remember, it might not be easy at times, but your love and your bond for one another is so special. And I think that's truly a gift. 
We are making our way through. All right. Do you feel as if you had to grow up faster than you should have? Absolutely. I definitely think that I grew up pretty fast. Um, I was definitely a lot more mature than my peers. Um, and I remember that kind of bothering me in high school and parts of college. I wanted to be the fun kid who just let loose and had a good time. And that's just not how I was wired. Um, I am very much uh, a family person and very much down to earth. Um, and ultimately, I don't regret my maturity. I, um, Danielle has made me into the person I am today. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And I think it's made me a much better person. And it's definitely impacted who I am and the choices I've made. I think it's it's put me on a pretty good path in life. So I definitely feel very blessed uh, for this journey that we're on together. Do you feel like you are well-informed regarding your siblings' medical needs? And do you feel as if that information was shared with you too early in life? I feel very informed with Danielle's uh, medical needs. So when we left uh, the Rare Disease Symposium in San Diego and we started to see uh, Dr. Evanson in Philadelphia, I hit this point where I've been involved with Danielle's medical needs my entire life. I know nothing else, but I still felt like I knew so little. Um, there was a, a point at Dr. Evanson's office where Dee wanted me to go back for her vital signs with her. And the nurse asked me what her height and weight was. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm a horrible caretaker. I need to be more informed of what's going on. So after that visit, I sat down with my parents and said, God forbid anything happens to you. I don't know as much as I need to. I know the high level things, um, but I need to be much more informed. So shout out to my mom. She's been putting all of the Excel sheets together of the lab works and the doctor visits and all of our specialists. Um, and that's been so helpful. And she's seen me on all of the emails with our doctors and Dee's um, team at school. I think that that's really helped me become more involved um, as I've transitioned from, you know, being a, a child and growing up with Danielle to now fulfilling more of a caretaker role and um, preparing for that transition into her early adulthood. Um, so that's been really beneficial. And again, I can't stress enough how much I think it helped me that nothing was ever hidden from me. Uh, I love that I was, that her medical information was shared with me at an early age because it felt very normal to me. Um, it, it, and to this day, I, I look back and I, I don't think that anything feels abnormal in the way that we live. I was putting this presentation together and I had to really sit down and think how is my life different than that of my friends? How, how am I different as a special needs sibling? So, and I, I give that all back to my parents always sharing things with me, not hiding things and being involved in the, the, those therapy sessions early on. So that's definitely my biggest advice. I'm definitely don't think that information can be shared too early. The next question, do you have any guilt about being capable of doing things that your sibling cannot? And I think when Danielle is sick or in pain, absolutely. I wish I could just absorb all of that hardship and I wish that I could be the one in that hospital bed. And I, th I think we've all been there. Um, I wish that I could be the one going through that. Um, but sadly, this was the cards that we were dealt and I just, learn to support her in every way I can and make her smile when she's going through those difficult times. Um, the other thing that I do feel a little guilty about is when I get to do fun things without Danielle. If my friends and I are going on a trip, I know how much she loves to travel and I need that friendship time, but also I know how much she loves it. So I feel bad not excluding her, but not including her in all of, all of my happenings. So we love to do sister sleepovers and she has lots of trips planned for us. So as long as I'm incorporating those into our, our daily lives, I, I feel much better um, about the guilt. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that a lot of siblings, I'm sure, feel a little bit guilty about. So how do you explain to your friends about your sibling's condition um, and were your friends willing to include your sibling? I remember being very confident um, with Danielle's medical needs and medical condition uh, from the start. I 
would always tell my friends about CDG, even strangers who asked. It was always an open book. It was never anything that I was sensitive towards. And I think that helped for my friends to really include her and not be scared of, you know, hurting her or hurting her feelings. Dee is very sassy. She fits in great with my friends. This is actually a photo. We went to a Steelers preseason game together. Me and seven of my friends and Danielle got to come. And she is just, she's one of us. She loves to text them and Snapchat them because ultimately they're her friends too. So we've been really fortunate to be surrounded by a really great group of friends for the last decade. Um, and even new friends still open, they accept her with open arms, which is really lovely. Um, so yeah, I, I think just being open with, with friends has been helpful and then ensuring that they accept us the way that we are. This is who we are. If they have odd feelings about special needs, I think education really helps and it goes a long way, especially for our younger kiddos out there. Um, it was definitely easier in high school and college because at that age, people have more experience with special needs. Uh, when you're in elementary school or grade school, it can be a little bit difficult to explain special needs and how our siblings are a little bit different, which in turn makes us a little bit different. Um, so if you're going through that, we've all been there, it gets easier, I promise. Um, did having a sibling with special needs impact what character traits you look for in your friends and, and or partner? Absolutely. Um, my friends have always, again, looked for people who have accepted Danielle and I for who we are uh, and have wanted to include her in things. And again, not talking about her, but talking to her um, and just being her friend too. She's just, she is my best friend. She is my, my go-to person. So it's equally as important that my friends get along with Danielle. Um, and they all do. They're, they're awesome. It's, it's actually really funny. Uh, dating as a special needs sibling is horrible. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely difficult. Uh, I was joking with my mom this morning. Um, it's like going on a first date. How do you say, hi, my name's Courtney. I'm a carrier for a rare disease. And one day my sister is going to live with me. Are you okay with that? <laughs> it's just something that um, we have some extra steps that we have to go through uh, when trying to find a partner. Um, and it makes it a little bit complicated. So if there's any uh, special needs siblings out there who have figured that out, I could use those tips. <laughs> um, but yeah, just finding people who are open and accepting to who we are uh, and love us for it. Did you ever have to confront people in public for stares or comments about your sibling? If so, how did you handle it? This was my funniest uh, question to reflect on. I am definitely someone who gets very mad when people stare and comment uh, rudely to Danielle. I wish that I could just calm down and educate people on why Danielle is in a wheelchair. Um, but since I was young, it has just really frustrated me um, that people aren't educated. Um, and sometimes we'll get the innocent questions of, oh, why is she in a wheelchair? And depending on the audience, you can address it a few different ways. Um, but it also makes it a little difficult because Danielle does not feel very comfortable talking about CDG and her diagnosis. So sometimes when people ask those questions, it's not an answer that Danielle wants to give or share openly. So it makes it a little bit difficult for us too to answer those questions. So sometimes we just say something like, oh, her legs are a little tired or her wheelchair helps her get around from place to place. Um, just something short and sweet that usually nips those awkward situations in the butt. Um, but it is definitely something that has infuri infuriated me for years. Um, so again, any siblings out there who have mastered this, please let me know because <laughs> I surely have not. <laughs> what makes my bond with Danielle so special? I, I, I wish I could say, I wish I could pinpoint it. I just love her so much. Um, she inspires me every single day. She makes me a better person. Uh, and I, I think again, we don't bond because of CDG. We just bond because we just get along so well and we see each other for who we are. And I think that's really beautiful. Um, I'm very protective of Dee and she admires me so much. So I think it's a nice, 
it's just a nice combination. Um, and uh, we have so much fun. We have sister secret time. We jam out to uh, music. Uh, we love getting iced coffee together. Don't tell Dr. Edmondson. Every once in a while, we share a white claw together. Um, so we just like to really bond over things that your atypical uh, sisters would do. Um, and that's also another thing is being able to turn off the caregiver hat and put on a sister hat every once in a while is really nice to not have to feel like I have to be there for her as a quote unquote parent figure, but to actually get to just bond together over something enjoyable that we both like to do is really helpful. So the next section is a little bit about future planning. Um, and to be quite frank, I worry about long-term care for Danielle often. I think it's one of my most anxiety-inducing topics. Um, and so it's an area that we've really been working through the last two years. Uh, we have a social worker we've been working very closely with to discuss life after college, Dan Danielle's five-year plan, uh, and where she will live uh, down the road as an older adult. Um, if it were up to Danielle, she'd already be living with me. Um, so that's something that, you know, we have to work through and, and talk through a bit more. Uh, I have always been a little fearful. I've, I've wanted to not regret living a normal life. I wanted to be able to have my life experiences, wanted to be able to enjoy different things. Um, and so as soon as I graduated college, uh, I love my family so much. They're so supportive, but I moved out and I got my first apartment just so I could feel like I had um, my, my own life and I could find my identity and my happiness outside of special needs. Um, so that was, was really helpful. And I think will prepare me down the road to be ready to accept Danielle into my home um, down the road. A really good question. Have you been genetically tested to know if you're a carrier? If so, how has that knowledge impacted you? So I did get tested um, to be a carrier, and I am a carrier. I went through the natural history study uh, just a few months ago, um, and it did come back that I was a carrier. Um, I willingly did this study, but looking back, I, I do think I wish at times I wish I would have waited a bit um, until I was ready to have kids to find out that information. Once you know, you can't unknow. Um, and it, it's been an emotional journey. It's, it's difficult, but I'm glad that I know and I can plan ahead now. Um, so ultimately I'm glad that I know, but it, it was, it's been emotional finding out that I'm a carrier. All right, I'm gonna put my parents on blast now. <laughs> what do you think your parents have done well for both you and your sibling? Alternatively, what do you wish your parents would have done differently to support you and your sibling? My parents have gone above and beyond. I cannot complain. They have been incredible. Uh, again, getting me involved at an early age has really been great to bond Danielle and I. They gave us so many opportunities. Um, but I think at times we have all struggled as caregivers to push you to be more independent. Um, it's something that the college program Danielle's currently in has really helped with. It's really given her a drive and a self-independence. She's really craving now. Um, so it's, it's made it easier for us to push her a little further. But I, I think that's one thing that I would love to see more from Danielle is that push to be more independent, packing your lunch, getting dressed in the morning. It's also so difficult too as caregivers because sometimes you have five minutes to get a task done. You don't have time for her to wait to do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes you just want the tasks done. Um, so it's, it's a hard balance, uh, but that's something that I've always been um, kind of the person to push Danielle to do more and to be better. Um, and that's something that I think I will always push her to do. And I think it's something that she does, she needs. Um, but my parents have done a great job in really pushing her to be more independent. What are some things that your parents did to encourage you to interact and bond with your sister? Again, therapy at an early age, it, it made things just so normalized for me. Um, 
they also didn't force me to be involved in Danielle's life, which was helpful. I chose this. I, I didn't choose to have a sister with special needs, but I, I chose to be involved and I chose to be an active participant in her life. Um, and I think having that choice, it helped me buy into the process. I think if I were forced, I would have a different mindset on it. After you've heard me talk for nearly 50 minutes, thank you so much for joining the presentation. Um, we are still going to continue to record, but this portion of the presentation will not be um, added later today um, or whenever we add it to the YouTube channel. Um, so feel free, ask away. Uh, my contact information is also on here. So if there's anything you don't feel comfortable asking in the group setting, feel free, send me a, an email. I'm happy to be a resource.